I have a sort of broad, broad question uh, for, for everyone, actually, which is, so, I mean, I started off this session talking about my own desire not to be dead, which is, is, a, is a desire that, that many of us here, I, I would think, share. So the qu question that, that I have for you guys is, is more kind of strategic, which is like, what, what do you think are the odds for those of us in this room of avoiding being dead, and what do you what do you think the odds would be if our society were to make a concerted effort to to dramatically mi minimize death? And so those are those are kind of it's sim similar to a question I ask at an AI conference of like what's what's the chance of making a thinking machine by 2050? What's the chance of doing it if society really made a priority? So we can uh, we can start with Aubrey and move move across. Probably start with Aubrey. Yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> well, I think the first thing I'd like to do is slightly rephrase the question, because I think that the prospects of having a concerted effort on the part of humanity are going to increase as we make progress anyway. Um, the more progress we make, the more enthusiasm is going to be to make further progress. So the chance so that eventually we will, we will get this concerted effort. The question is how soon we'll get it and how much time will we lose before we get it uh, relative to the alternative of having that concerted effort begin now. Um, I think we could be looking still at uh, around 10 years of delay caused by the continued, you know, the remaining apathy that's going to occur before we really pull it, uh, get enough of a proof of concept to really get things going. So in terms of people in this room, I think that could make a good, like pretty, pretty much for everyone in this room, everyone aged between 20 and 60, I'd say, there could be between 5 and 15 percent different change. You know, we would, we, we, would be we would be reducing our chances of making the cut by that sort of amount, I'd say. Yeah. Always hard to follow, Aubrey. Uh, <clears throat> gee. I basically agree with this first point, which is, and I actually made this point in my book, The Long Tomorrow, that what we're waiting for is the killer app. Um, the killer I mean, app of death. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, the, what, what transformed, I'm old enough, of course, to remember the days when uh, Apple computers were a brand new thing. And uh, what was the killer app then? Well, it was really word processing. That was really what transformed uh, computers from toys that were in hobbyist garages to something everybody want, wanted. I and think to... Yeah, that would be another one. one. Yeah, 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 be another one, sure. But you get the concept, oh, yeah. yeah. I think the one thing we have in favor of us, other than our bridge rhetorical skills, uh, <laughs> is the fact that the budgets of OECD countries are going to be monumentally screwed, not by the wave of mortality, by the wave of morbidity associated with aging. Mm. They have a huge, I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars worldwide, incentive to slow down the rate by which people become incapacitated and phenomenally expensive for governments. And when they wake up to that, and remember, we're talking about government, so them waking up to anything, that's always a dubious proposition. But when they wake up to that, they will love Aubrey de Grey. One of the things that I remember back in the year 2000 when Aubrey came to visit uh, the Kronos group in Phoenix, Arizona, when Chris Hewitt and I were talking about the killer app, what would be the thing that would make the rest of the scientific community notice, and that, I think, was the inception of the Methuselah Prize. If we could double the lifespan of a mouse, then people would have to notice us and say, well, if you can do it for a mouse, you ought to be able to do it for a human. And that would revolutionize NIH funding for biogerontology. Now, I think I have to pass the microphone back to Aubrey to say, what happened to the Methuselah Mouse Prize? So the key thing that, the, the key nuance that you forgot to mention in that conversation back in 2000 was that we were looking at the possibility of somewhere around doubling, shall we say, mouse lifespan, but particularly with interventions that were initiated when the mice were already in middle age. That's a key point, which absolutely, I, I think, and I think Chris agreed with me at the time, um, is a, a, an essential criterion for getting the society in general as excited as they need to be. 
Um, so the situation with the Methuselah mouse prizes at the moment, uh, I, of course, I should remind everybody, I don't work for the Methuselah Foundation anymore. Sense Foundation was created about 18 months ago, and um, there's no overlap of personnel, but we certainly talk to each other a great deal, so I can tell you reasonably up-to-date information. Uh, no one's actually won any of them. You know, we haven't had any progress there. Um, the famous experiment with rapamycin that was published a year and a half ago, something like that, um, where uh, this particular drug extended lifespan of mice in the interventional testing program by the NIA, that came fairly close to winning one of the prizes, the Rejuvenation Prize, and actually the Methuselah Foundation gave, them, gave the investigators a $10,000 consolation prize as a result. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, these prizes are designed to be incremental. Even if you beat the world record by a small amount, you still get a small amount of money. Um, whereas the threshold level that I felt, w and I still feel, is necessary in order to actually really turn public opinion over is the sort of threshold that you were describing, something in the region of doubling of mass lifespan starting late in life. I guess I'll probably chime in on from a commercial perspective. I'm actually quite optimistic. I'm, I'm optimistic that people are actually going to look at making money in this space, and so therefore they're going to start putting more and more money uh, into the type of research which we consider aging related, but really pharma and biotech really look at this as disease. And so they're looking at treating disease. We may call it different things, but fundamentally the objective is the same. So uh, especially some of the more recent advances we've been seeing. Uh, most recently, Geron got, put, got taken off of hold about two months ago. I mean, that's extremely promising. That means there will be a glial progenitor cell therapy tested in humans shortly. So we don't know exactly when that's that is. They did their first case. Oh, they, oh they, they have done their first case. OK, yes, yes. yes. So in Atlanta, we, Georgia. And we don't know the results of that at the moment, because I think they're keeping that, obviously, We're relatively street secret. secret. And they don't want to break the actual, um, the actual um, the power of the actual study if that's the case. Very often pharma and biotech do that. So it's coming. So expect within the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot more work in stem cells. And in fact, there's stuff that's at a much earlier stage, which is not publicized. Um, and I've, uh, you know, I've, I've seen things that, that obviously I'm bound by CDAs that I can't disclose, but there are a lot of really interesting therapies out there. So um, stay tuned. Next couple of years, it's exciting. OK, I guess I'm a little more pessimistic. Um, the. Uh, <laughs> So I remember from uh, in 2008, like the end of the year, Seed magazine like totaled up the amount of spending on science, R&D. It's like science total for the globe. And it was like 895 billion, not even a trillion dollars. Right? And the United States debt is now 14 trillion. So you can kind of do that comparison uh, and then wonder like, well, when are we going to see progress? Well, when you use some of our ingenuity to come up with financial instruments that can figure out how to pay for this stuff in terms of future productivity gains or rather than packaging up a bunch of toxic bogus instruments that then cause a giant pyramid scheme. So uh, I think we are going to be able to drop the cost of some kind of research down to near you know, what it's like for software. And we're seeing that in sequencing. Uh, China, of course, is the biggest purchaser of Illumina sequencers a year ago. They bought like all of them that Illumina came out with, this next generation thing, right? So they've got more capacity right there than the whole NCI, I think, right? So these uh, countries are coming online, so to speak. China, India you know, will be entering the global scientific uh, you know, enterprise in ever greater numbers, and that can accelerate things. So um, maybe there's just one, one yeah. item to add on that. So uh, just to give you an example of where we are right now in terms of um, cost, so one CEO, and this wasn't under confidence, this was just a discussion that we had. One CEO told me that he had been able to actually get proteins produced in China for, I believe, under $20,000. He's testing out a theory. And so he was actually able to use relatively clean, still a little dirty, the actual proteins. But he's, he's actually able to get protein stock to actually test his idea, ideas for under $20,000. So that gives you an idea of where we are cost-wise. Uh, it, well, I mean, when you're talking about in, industrial scale manufacturing, it's enormous. I mean, it can go up to millions of dollars to actually manufacture proteins. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's changing, and obviously these are, these are small batches, but it's still quite exciting. So, yeah, I see uh, David Kekage has joined us here in the audience. Could you say a word or two about Reverse Aging Incorporated? Uh, the company is actually uh, called Age Reversal Inc. 
And David Saloff was here. He had to leave. He's our CEO. Um, we are set up as a uh, venture capital company. We've spoken with about a dozen underwriters in New York the last couple of uh, last month or so. And um, we've raised some money uh, last year, this early this year, a couple of million dollars. We're uh, set to raise a whole lot more. And I really can't talk much about it because we have an integration issue with the SEC. We have we have to close. Well, anyway, it's, it's complicated. But starting in January, uh, we're going to be um, raising, we think, significant money to be investing in some of the technologies that Steve and uh, a lot of I, a lot of us have been following uh, since our first Manhattan Beach conference in the year 2000. And Aubrey and Michael, were, of course, were there. And um, so, yeah, we're we're we have a goal to reverse aging or have the capability re to reverse aging by 2029. And we think if all our stars are lined up and we raise all the money and invest it the right way, we'll, be, you know, we'll, we'll do it. And hopefully in January, uh, if anybody wants to reach us, just go to maxlife.org or manhattanbeachproject.com and you'll be able to find some information. Thank you, Steve. So yeah, does anyone from the audience have a, have a, any more questions? So this is um, a, an opportunity to um, explore the darker side of things for a little bit. Um, we know that um, from studies of decision making and risk aversion that negative information weighs far more heavily on a person's mind than positive information. So uh, with that in mind, um, the potential cost savings uh, for um, in, in reduced morbidity would pale in comparison to the, the extra money that would, would be paid out in pensions over, you know, adding 100 years to someone's life. So what do you think, do you think it is plausible that we would see some sort of um, astroturfing, you know, kind of anti-longevity astroturfing? Is that possible? Well, what, what, of course, a anything is possible where large masses of people are, are, are concerned. But I mean, my, my, my own personal view, just based on knowledge of human nature, is that once, a a as Aubrey and, and Michael said, and some others alluded to, once, once it becomes clear to people that there is actually a viable possibility of them and their mother and their father and their girlfriend, their boyfriend, their kids actually living longer and, and not getting, and it's not just dying, it's not getting old and sick and having their brains stop working and they're being in pain. Once this really seems like a viable possibility, my gut feel is that almost everyone is gonna go for it. And the religions that now say, well, living a long time is bad, I think they're gonna, they're gonna be creative and come up with reasons why, 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 why it's actually okay. Like once, uh, once, once the possibility is there. And I mean, it comes down to a personal thing, on, even on the part of political decision makers. I mean, they have loved ones and families and, and they have their own bodies that they don't want to, to get old and die. And that's, but that, that's, of course, there will be some subset of the population that is opposed to it, just as you have religious groups opposing the use of medical care now, and you have the Taliban that wants to roll back to the 1400s. But I, I, I would be surprised if those subgroups are, are dominant, because when you come down to it, getting old and dying, it, it sucks, right? For, for you and, and the ones you love. Sort of a, a sort of a play on the um, the word grassroots. So grassroots organizations, you know, um, come up as sort of a populist movement. But sometimes these things that look like grassroots movements aren't really, and so they're called astroturf. Could you have big companies or government groups or something tr trying to stir up kind of bogus popular opposition to, to longevity? The Bush Bioethics Panel was attempting to do exactly that to. Uh, gerontology and anti-aging research during that administration. For some reason, they're no longer with us. <laughs> yeah, they're all dead. 
Cheney may not be with us much longer, but, but Leon Cass, the MD, PhD from the University of Chicago, was the chairman of the Bioethics Council under former President Bush. And they wrote many lengthy academic and scholarly documents with footnotes explaining why it was not in the interests of our civilization to go down a path toward increasing longevity because death was good for society. Um, hopefully, the, the religious right wing will be completely ignored by the you know, members of the youth in our society when we have a dramatic demonstration that intervention in lifespan is possible. Right now, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I think there's, there's it's a secondary point to the more personal aspects, but I think there's also an international competitive aspect to it. And that once, once one of the first world countries, I mean, in a hypothesis where different countries had different policies, which may not even be the case significantly, but in that hypothesis, l l let's say that the U.S. let people live a long time and Europe made everyone die young, right? I mean, this is going to benefit the U.S. economically, ultimately, once society reorganizes a bit, because people who know a lot and are competent at doing things will be able to keep on doing those things instead of getting old and, and retarded and demented and so forth. And I think that that country will flourish economically, which will cause others to want to, want to, to compete with it. Following up, and unless there's other uh, questions out there. Um, the, uh, you mentioned that there's the, you need the youth, you need the fresh thinking to come up to kind of challenge these, you know, uh, set in mindsets of the, um, of the older people. You know, how do you, is there, is there a chance that, well, if you have these people who are who have the, the reins of power and they're staying alive forever, you know, maybe some of these are some of the, the religious right wing people. How do you get that? Well, sort of I, novelty I think that challenge this, that? F f there's a couple reactions I have to that, and I'll stop talking too much. But if you look at the people up here who are doing kind of innovative maverick work, not all are under 20 years old, right? So the I mean, there, there's, there's not such a correlation between innovativeness and, and age. And of course, I, I think the whole Silicon Valley movement in the US is a demonstration that in the US, there are mechanisms for letting innovative young people gather a great deal of power and control a lot of resources. So my, my bet is that society would reorganize itself fairly well to, to account for this, this demographic shift. But I'll, I'll give the mic to someone else. Yeah. Uh, hold it lower. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, uh, when I try to solve a problem, I think about resources. And I heard very, uh, I'm very new to this area, so I'm learning a lot to this afternoon. But I heard very different models of how to even think about the problem of longevity. Um, so, and as I'm taking it all in, I think Joe's point of view is pretty clear in terms of regulation law. I'd like to kind of hear from the other speakers in terms of people, in terms of quality of ideas in terms of money, in terms of our uh, legal system, what is really the bottleneck from moving forward? Um. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the iron law of medicine is that the MDs always get paid. And that has been true for thousands of years. And if you read, so one of the things that amuses me is Middlemarch, the novel by George Eliot in the 19th century, a large part of which concerns the reform of medical practice. And in this novel, she makes extremely clear the extent to which it all revolves around MDs getting paid. And in the 20th century United States, you basically add MDs and pharma companies. So now the rule is the MDs and the pharma companies have to get paid. So if they can find a way to make more money out of this, it will happen, because they will force government to change the regulation. But that's sort of, in a sense, what we're talking about with the killer app question. Because it's actually not even, in this country anyway, what the citizenry thinks, it's what the MDs and the pharma companies think. Once you get those behind something, it will happen. It's sort of like, you know, a new weapon system in the U.S. military. Same basic and concept. Stop blocking socialized medicine. Exactly, and that's why it happened. Precisely. Thank you very much for that. Very appropriate. Yeah, yeah uh, um, the other thing I would add to that is that 
we have to distinguish between the point, perhaps 25 years from now, when these medicines come along, and the much earlier point when these medicines become widely anticipated, when basically the consensus scientific opinion, the public scientific opinion on camera, is that it's only a matter of time before this sort of thing happens. I don't know exactly when that shift in public, public expert opinion is going to occur, there's going to be a certain amount of proof of concept necessary in the lab. But that first point, that earlier time point, is the one that really matters for all of this. Because that's when opinion formers like Oprah Winfrey and so on are going to start saying, well, let's get these medicines for human beings sooner rather than later. And that's the point when it's going to be impossible to, be, become impossible to get elected unless you have some kind of manifesto commitment to have a war on aging, more or less. So, at that point, basically, the thing turns around a little bit. Essentially, it's the public driving public policy, as they always do. Public policy, obviously, in countries where the main goal of politicians is to get re-elected, which is, thankfully, pretty much all the countries we're talking about. Um, you know, th that means that the governments will then do whatever necessary. They will, you know, reconstruct the FDA from the ground up to, the, to whatever in whatever way necessary, reconstruct the tax system, reconstruct in particular the compensation system for MDs and for pharma companies, so as to ensure that these things, that, that, that people's motivations are aligned, at least to a sufficient extent, that the politicians do get, indeed get re-elected. Yeah, I, I concur. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our gerontology research group discussion group, maybe 250 people, scientists worldwide, have maybe a dozen email messages back and forth to each other seven days a week. They don't stop on Saturday and Sunday. And I can really um, have a hard time keeping up with all of the chatter. But um, one thing uh, that people may not know is that I'm an evangelist for stem cell therapy, especially of the autologous, you know, induced pluripotent stem cell variety. And there is an important FDA lawsuit that is um, on the horizon, maybe for 2011, that will dictate exactly where this field will go in terms of controlling it, because the FDA has put a stake in the sand saying that stem cell therapy should be treated as a drug. And that means it will be owned by Big Pharma because the only people who have deep enough pockets to make the necessary investments to go through phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials are the big pharmaceutical companies. And yet there is a small group of physicians, MDs, who are arguing that this is not the domain of Big Pharma and FDA. Instead, it is the domain of the practice of medicine. And if you take someone's cells from them, modify them either by liposuction or whatever, you have or bone marrow, blood, there's a lot of different sources, even hair follicles, for getting hold of your own adult stem cells and inducing them to become pluripotent and then reinfusing them back into the body of a person who has a certain illness in the hope that you will cure it. If you do that in 24 hours, you are not modifying this and then allowing it to be treated as a drug. These are the patient's own cells and they go back into the patient and that is the practice of medicine. And if the FDA attempts to intervene in that practice, they are outside the charter that the Congress has given the FDA not to intervene in the practice of medicine. Now, Chris Santino, one of my colleagues in Denver, is a um, um, party to this lawsuit. And you will see his name in the newspapers starting in January, February, when this actually appears in court in Washington, D.C. So, you know, that's uh, an early warning for what you should be looking for as to where stem cell therapy will go. I would just like to note that's a fight between the MDs and pharma for yes. the money. Yes, exactly. exactly. And, and Do you have something to say to the question? No, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's, it's I think that the... The response I would have to the question of, in terms of what's the bottleneck, I, I largely agree with these preceding comments, but I think a different point of view is to say that the, the biggest bottleneck is just the, the fundamental short-sightedness of, of our overall 
social and, and, and economic system and our research funding establishment. And there's, there's short-sightedness in government funding agencies, fu funding research, where, where you basically you're rewarded for turning out papers in good journals on a fairly rapid basis. And, you know, many of us who are scientists know how to do that, but we also know how to do longer-term research, which may make more progress fundamentally, but doesn't generate as impressive-looking incremental results, and it's hard to get that sort of research funded. I mean, you, 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 can, you can do it, just as, as Michael managed to evolve these flaws over a long period of time, but you're often working around the funding mechanisms rather than with them, and it's, it's hard, and sometimes it doesn't work. And then on the, on the angel and venture funding side, in, in the same way, investors have a certain responsibility to the people who gave them money to invest, or they have a certain mindset regarding their own money that they're investing, and they want returns fairly rapidly with a fairly high confidence, and this doesn't always agree with what would be fundamentally right in terms of advancing totally gold, like making people live a long time. And of course, what, what Dave Kekich and his colleagues are doing with, with ARI is trying to, to work around that through, through creative funding mechanisms, and there, there are ways to do it, but the basic mechanisms of funding research and development work are quite short-sighted relative to the needs of the underlying work. And that, that ties in with, with China, which several people have mentioned. Because I, I think, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in China in the last few years, and there's certainly many, many problems with the way that research and everything else is, is organized there. On the other hand, they do get long-term thinking right, much, much better than, than, than the U.S. does, which, is, which may be a significant point. I mean, they, they really will plan things on a multi-decade basis, whereas we tend to be looking at quarterly profits or, or what's, can we get this company acquired by Google in three years or something. So that, that, that's, that's a point in, in favor of some other countries besides the U.S. I think if, if somehow we tuned our system to be less short-sighted, we could make massively more rapid progress on, on a whole bunch of fronts. I think we were pretty much out of time. I we can take one more quick question. I, I think there's a very visible but unnoticed huge public interest in longevity and even immortality visible in the culture right now in that millions of copies of vampire novels are sold to young people <laughs> every week. Yet yeah, there are no vampires in attendance here. And That's the, right. fundamental, yeah. the fundamental well, nature not of yet. these vampires well, yeah. is that they're long-lived, <laughs> They're extremely strong and robust. They're romantic, and all the young people want to interact with them. <laughs> so if there's some way to tap into this interest in vampires and saying, your grandparents can be vampires too, or at least have all the benefits of it without having to send someone to blood. All right, I think that, that that's a wonderful note on which to end this session for today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.